Along with the new year comes the prospect of living up to many of those resolutions to better ourselves. Unfortunately, sometimes those resolutions can fall by the wayside. But you know, you don't have to look very far in nature to find inspiration and good role models for sticking to something and getting the job done. These little guys, the bees, are some of the most industrious workers on the planet. All spring, summer, and even into the fall, they were gathering nectar and pollen for the winter. These hives are full of honey, which will sustain the bees for the next few months until temperatures warm and they can start foraging again. What's interesting is that scientists tell me that to produce one pound of honey, the bees will travel collectively 50,000 miles and they'll visit five million flowers. These numbers are even more astonishing when you consider that there's 80 to 100 pounds of honey in these hives, and that's after I harvested my share last fall. Another fascinating thing about bees is that even though they're cold-blooded, they can maintain a constant temperature in the hive. If temperatures drop as low as 50 below zero or as high as 120 degrees, they can still keep it constant. As you can see, they were way ahead of us in developing a central heat and air system. If you're looking for a model of efficiency, you don't have to look any further than the bees. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. I'm a big advocate of using lots of mulch in the garden during the summer when it's hot and dry. You see, this does a number of things. It keeps plenty of moisture in the soil, keeps weeds down, and makes it look better. But another thing it does is it provides a healthier environment for some garden helpers that I've come to depend on, the earthworms. You see, as the soil gets hot, the earthworms burrow deeper into the subsoil. By putting a thick layer of mulch on top, you cool the soil, and this invites the worms to move closer to the surface. After all, it's the first six to eight inches that are the most important for a beautiful garden. Now, what these earthworms do for the garden is process large amounts of organic matter. But what's fascinating to me is how they do it. They actually consume the soil. They keep a certain amount of nutrient for themselves and expel the rest as castings, and this enriches the soil. To give you an idea of the kind of workforce we're talking about here, the USDA figures that in an acre of land, you can have up to 500,000 earthworms, and those earthworms collectively can move five tons of soil in a year. In the process of all of this moving, the worms create a vast network of tiny little air spaces which aerate the soil. We don't often think of it, but you know our soil is living, and some gardeners measure the health of their soil by the number of earthworms that are, say, in a square foot of it. The more, the merrier. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. Each spring when my garden is full of glorious bloom, it's a reminder to me of the bounty of nature. It also reminds me that it's time to start dealing with pests. I'm always looking for earth-friendly approaches to dealing with problems in the garden. When it comes to insects, one of my favorite philosophies is to fight fire with fire, so to speak, pitting good bugs against bad bugs. Let me give you an example. This is a whole platoon of ladybugs. These little gals are considered beneficial insects for what they can do for us in the garden. You see, they've developed quite a reputation over the years as having quite an appetite for aphids. But ladybugs just don't stop here. They also enjoy eating scale, mealybugs, as well as mites. I know it's hard to believe, but there's an army of over 1,500 ladybugs in this container. Now, I won't release all of them today. I'll wait a few days before I send in the second wave. Soon, these adult ladybugs will lay eggs and larvae will hatch. Now, the larvae look like tiny black alligators with orange spots. It's important to identify them. The main thing to remember when using beneficial insects in your garden is to not use pesticides. You see, the pesticides will kill the bad bugs as well as the good ones. If you'd like more information on organic approaches to gardening, just check out my website. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. There are some pests in the garden that can be difficult to see. Then there are others that are much more obvious, like these bagworms. It's easy to see the effect they can have on plants. For instance, this Leyland cypress, of which I use for screening, is much weaker than the ones next to it. It's because the caterpillars have been munching on its foliage. Let me explain how the cycle of this pest works. You see, it all begins in a little bag or pouch like this. 
believe it or not, one of these can contain up to 500 eggs. Now once those eggs hatch, they hatch as caterpillars. They climb out onto the foliage and munch all over our plants. At the same time, these caterpillars are spinning new pouches or bags for next year. Then what happens is they climb into the pouch, emerge after a while as a moth, and then the females go back in there and lay more eggs so the whole generation or cycle can start again. Sounds pretty complicated, doesn't it? But the main thing to remember here is that it's the caterpillar that does all of the damage in the spring. One of the best ways I've found to deal with these little devils is to hit them when they're the most vulnerable as caterpillars. And one of the safest methods I've found is to use BT. This is actually a concentration of bacteria. You just spray it on, the caterpillar eats it and dies. Since they're not feeding now, I'll pull as many off as I can and go after the rest in the spring with BT. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. I always look forward to the arrival of spring, even though it represents extra work for me in the garden. But along with Easter can come garden helpers that can keep certain pests under control. Ducks can be one of the best ways to deal with slugs and snails in the garden, and a lot of fun to have around. This little guy is only a couple of hours old, but since he has plenty of egg yolk still stored in his system, he won't need to eat for a couple of days so he can be shipped anywhere in the world. In just a matter of weeks, these day-old ducklings will double and triple in size, seemingly overnight. They'll turn into slug-eating machines. They love the flavor of them, and a few ducks can eat hundreds of them in a day. Now, if you think domesticated ducks only come in one model, like the standard Pekin duck from nursery rhymes, you better look again. These solid black ones with a green sheen are called Cayugas, and the ruins are a French breed that look like a big fat mallard. And if you love the duck in the movie Babe as much as I did, you won't be able to resist these slender Indian runner ducks. If you're looking for a duck that's already dressed for Easter, you might try one of these white crested ducks. It's already wearing its Easter bonnet. It's a busy time here at Metzer Farms in Gonzales, California. They're dispatching thousands of ducklings across the country, so the slugs and snails better watch out. Having a few ducks around can be entertaining and a lot of fun for children. But the best reason for me as a gardener is that it makes slugs and snails a part of the food chain. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith.